Um, looks like we're live. So. Okay. Well, we're here. I guess we'll have to wait for them. We are live now. <laughs> it looks like on top of the screen it popped up. So it said webinar is now streaming live. Oh, it says live. Okay. Great. Dr. Well, welcome Schreiber. everyone. <laughs> My name is Erin Shriver and I'm the immediate past president of Women in Ophthalmology. It's an honor to be here uh, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'd like to thank the AIOS Organizing Committee, and in particular, Dr. Namrata Sharma, for giving women ophthalmology the opportunity to showcase who we are and what we are, uh, uh, what we are all about during this outstanding conference. I'm joined by several of my esteemed colleagues who you'll meet today from the Board of Women Ophthalmology with different subspecialty expertise, and we're going to speak about innovations in ophthalmology. So our first speaker today is Dr. Lisa Nijem. Dr. Nijem is a cornea surgeon at Warrenville Eye, Eye Care and LASIK, and she's a licensed attorney and an assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology at the University of Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary in Chicago. She also serves as the CEO of Women in Ophthalmology, mentors physicians through mdnegotiations.com, and advises leading device and pharmaceutical companies on new innovations in ophthalmology. She was the first surgeon in her region to do femtosecond LASIK, and she's taught over 2,500 ophthalmologists as co-director of the Osler Ophthalmology Board Review course. As past president of Women Ophthalmology, Dr. Nijam led the organization through a time of immense growth, and most recently, she developed a clinical trials training curriculum for us as well. So you'll be learning more about that later today. Uh, she's received numerous awards and uh, honors, but one of the most uh, notable is that she was at the top five influential ophthalmologists globally from the Ophthalmologist Powerless in 2019. She's got her finger on the pulse of every facet of ophthalmology, and she's continually pushing us as individuals and as women ophthalmology as an organization to aim and exceed our own expectations. Today, she's going to be talking with us about the Avengers Endgame in dry eye and glaucoma. Welcome, Dr. Nijim. Thanks so much for that warm introduction. And thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, Sharmata and everybody at AIOS for having us here. It's an honor to be here. As Dr. Shriver mentioned, I'm gonna be speaking to you today about the Avengers Endgame, Dry Eye and Glaucoma. And I promise I will find a way to bring these two together. These are my financial disclosures. And here are the objectives I'm gonna to discuss today in my talk. So first, I wanna discuss the global impact of dry eye and glaucoma, and then discuss some of the steps that you can take to identify ocular surface disease in the glaucoma patient, and wrap up with an understanding of the current and emerging treatments to decrease IOP while minimizing toxicity on the ocular surface. So we're gonna start with a pop quiz here, make sure everybody is paying attention. So what is the prevalence of ocular surface disease in glaucoma patients? Uh, is it A, 20 to 30%, B, 40 to 50, C, 50 to 60, D, 70 to 80, or E, glaucoma patients have ocular surface disease? Uh, and I say that in jest, obviously. I think of ocular surface disease as Thanos. So everything bad, <laughs> when he comes, when ocular surface disease is there, it makes wrecks havoc on the entire uh, eye and the entire globe, and especially in combination with glaucoma. So hopefully, the good thing about being virtual is I can't see whether you got this right or not, but hopefully everybody chose B because uh, it's about 40 to 50% prevalence of ocular surface disease in glaucoma patients. And when we look at these comorbid conditions, we find that this is actually a global dilemma. Uh, I did a recent literature search and you will find reports of the prevalence of dry eye and glaucoma globally. Uh, these are just a few excerpts from the Romanian Journal of Ophthalmology in Saudi Arabia, in Thailand, in Australia. There's documentation of the high prevalence of dry eye and glaucoma occurring together in populations across the globe. So this research led to a consortium uh, that I put together of cornea and glaucoma specialists internationally to do a thorough literature review and to really understand the dual dilemma of dry eye and glaucoma. And we published uh, this international review last December in the Asia Pacific Journal of Ophthalmology. This is an open access article. So anybody can have, uh, can view it at any time. You don't need a subscription to the journal and 
obviously I'm going to encourage you to read it. Uh, I know that some of you already are because uh, in my preparation for this presentation, I found uh, that we are in the top 25% of all research outputs ever tracked, which made me happy not only for the paper, but really for the bigger issue here, which is I think we've been missing the diagnosis of dry eye and glaucoma and ways that we can help treat these patients better. The DUES-2 uh, task force looked at topical glaucoma medications that are considered to cause or aggravate dry eye disease. And at first, you would think maybe some of the drugs out there don't wreak havoc on the surface, are more gentle on the surface. But the fact of the matter is they found that all the classes of drugs, when they're preservatives, do indeed cause or aggravate dry eye disease. And then when you look at the adverse ocular effects in glaucoma patients when they have ocular surface disease compared to when they don't, there is significantly more glaucoma patients that have ocular uh, effects with OSD than do not. And just looking briefly at this table, for body sensation, 12 times more likely. Um, hyperemia, six times more likely. Ocular pain, 12 times more likely. And we know that the presence of these symptoms negatively influences the glaucoma patient's quality of life and ultimately their compliance. Okay. The amount and duration of treatment offers further risk factors for dry eye disease in the glaucoma patients. So we know that preservatives have both a dose-dependent and time-dependent adverse effect on the cornea and the conjunctiva. The effects of BAK have been well marked in the literature. And in fact, there's some data out of an IOVS study from a few years ago showing that BAK may preferentially affect the uh, cells in glaucoma patients because of their genetic markers. We know that glaucoma patients under treatment for three or more years were five times at a greater risk of developing ocular surface disease. So this is a significant concern. When we were looking at this global review, uh, you know, literally across countries and everybody finding the same problems with glaucoma and ocular surface, it really highlighted the need to have teamwork from all specialists. Uh, and what I mean by that is sometimes as glaucoma specialists, we may be only looking at the pressure or myself as a cornea specialist, more focus on the surface. And really what this review highlights is the need for for all specialists to come together and work as a team to treat these comorbid conditions, much like the Avengers had to come together to defeat Thanos, which you'll recall from the beginning of the presentation was dry eye disease. Okay. So it, to give you a mnemonic to remember this and to think about when you're examining your patients, I want you to think about Iron Man. So when examining the ocular surface of your glaucoma patients, I to identify OSD early, R recall all the tools available to diagnose dry eyes, O to opt for preservative free treatment, N to note treatment options beyond artificial tears, and MAN, M to make recommendations for alternate glaucoma therapies now. We'll go through these briefly. So first to identify ocular surface disease early, I really think this is one of the keys to treating these dual conditions uh, more effectively. Because when patients come in with baseline ocular surface disease that's untreated, and then glaucoma medications are added to the surface, you really are just fueling the fire. And I fully believe that ocular surface disease can be routinely evaluated in every patient that we see in clinic if you incorporate just a few pointed questions into the HPI. I've listed them here. Uh, for time's sake, I'll tell you that the one that I tend to focus on most is if they have periods of fluctuating vision, uh, because ultimately that's a cue to me that I need to be looking carefully at the ocular surface to see if that's contributing to their visual problems and if they have signs of dry eyes. Asking patients if they are dry, do they have problems when they're working on their iPad or TV, watching TV for prolonged periods of time or reading, how sensitive they are to light, and do they feel dry, pain, painful, or sore? 
The R was to remember all the diagnostic tools and devices that we have to evaluate ocular surface disease. Don't forget, looking at topography can give you signs if there are areas that are missing or irregular mires that there is OSD. Um, differences in tear osmolarity, uh, elevated MMP9. And then in looking at the literature review, we found that glaucoma patients tend to have greater conjunctival staining in the superior and nasal fornices. So that's something to look for as well. In addition, there are glaucoma medications such as the prostaglandins that are associated with a higher rate of meibomian gland dysfunction and are thought to cause meibomian gland dysfunction. And so imaging the meibomian gland of these glaucoma patients can also be key in identifying ocular surface disease. The O is to opt for preservative-free treatment. You want to consider combination therapies whenever possible and look for preservative-free formulas to be gentler on the ocular surface from the very beginning. And this paper from Tigerson highlighted how there was a decrease in concomitant symptoms of OSD when preservative-free medications were used or when patients were switched from preservative, preserve, preserve drops to preservative-free drops. The end was to note treatment options beyond artificial tears. There are a lot of things available in the dry eye world now, and they're all very important in our toolbox to tackle the incombinant OSD and glaucoma diseases. Actually, uh, in the US, we have two different types of cyclosporin and lafitograst. In Japan and Europe, there are more forms of cyclosporin that you have available, which is key because it, oftentimes with cyclosporin is the vehicle that's going to make the difference of what the patient can tolerate. Topical or oral antibiotics, punctal plugs, and something I've incorporated more recently in my practice has been the physical heating and expression of meibomian glands. We know that of dry eye patients, 86% of those patients, according to studies, have meibomian gland dysfunction. And so I have found in the midst of conducting a clinical trial right now on this, I found that glaucoma patients have some of the worst meibomian gland disease and therefore benefit the greatest from this form of treatment. And then the man, the iron man portion, was to make recommendations for alternate glaucoma therapies now. I know Dr. Pappas will be talking about innovations in glaucoma later, so I won't belabor this point, but there are a lot of innovations that are available, be it MIGs, be it sustained release implants, or as we saw in some of the most recent studies, laser therapy replacing topical drops as first-line treatment. So there are a lot of alternates that we can look at to preserve the surface in glaucoma patients. So in conclusion, it's important to recognize the high comorbidity of ocular surface disease and glaucoma. And I want you to remember Iron Man when you want to defeat Thanos Okay, actually what I mean is that we need to work as a team in evaluating and treating the ocular surface of glaucoma patients to maximize compliance and outcomes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, all of my contact information, uh, email and any of the social media handles. Uh, thank you again for this honor to present. And I think, yeah, there we go. Okay. Dr. Schreiber, are you gonna make yours full screen? Or Okay, there we go, great. I've got a full All screen now. Okay, perfect. All the technical challenges, um, but we, we handle them smoothly. So uh, she gave me such a kind introduction earlier. I hope I can do the same. Uh, Dr. Aaron Shriver is a clinical professor and the Jim O'Brien Gross and Danita Gross Professor in Ophthalmology within the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science at the University of Iowa. She's actively involved in clinical practice, teaching, research, and advocacy. Dr. Shriver is immediate past president of Women in Ophthalmology. She chaired the summer symposium in 2013 and has served on the board of directors since 2014. She's also the immediate past president of the Iowa Academy of Ophthalmology and participated in the leadership development program through AAO. Dr. Shriver is the ASOPERS delegate to the American Medical Association, secretary of the ASOPERS Foundation, and serves multiple roles in the ASOPERS Education Committee. 
Her research interests includes advances in oculoplastic techniques, critical analysis of current oculoplastic practices, establishing novel metrics for eyelid position and aesthetics, thyroid eye disease, intimate partner violence in ophthalmology patients, and the physics of eyelid malposition. When she's not working, she enjoys exercising and spending time with her husband and sons. And we've been very grateful for her leadership at Women in Ophthalmology the past year, particularly in the international arena. And I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, so Dr. Shriver, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Nijim. That's a tough fact to follow. My sons would love your Avenger theme. <laughs> so uh, I, again, I'm thrilled that we're here today. Uh, I, I wanted to tell you when I thought about, well, what would I really want to talk about? I'm an oculoplastic surgeon, and uh, this year has been a tough year for all of us uh, with COVID. But there was one shining light this year that really got me excited about my practice and kind of was a game changer. So I was, uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys about that today. Uh, we're going to talk about the advances in thyroid um, eye disease management. I have been a consultant and an advisor for Horizon Therapeutics. I'm not on their speakers bureau. I don't have any other financial interest with them. So I actually went into the field of ophthalmology because as a med student, I met one patient, actually it was on my Odo rotation, who underwent an orbital decompression. And I saw the lookbook of the transformation that these uh, in the U.S., it's typically middle-aged women, but that these uh, patients went through, um, and I thought, gosh, I really want to be a part of that. Uh, so I went into ophthalmology for thyroid eye disease, and actually I did an Occupostics fellowship thinking I was going to be a person that specialized in thyroid eye disease. Uh, but you know what? After fellowship, I practiced for a few years. I built up a big practice of thyroid eye disease patients, founded a regional support group, and then I kind of lost my passion for it. And I really felt because I felt like I was helpless. I held their hands through the disease process, but I didn't have good tools in my toolkit. And it was really frustrating. But this year, everything has, uh, has really changed for me. Um, I'm going to start out by telling you a story of a woman. And this is going to, you're going to feel the emotion of why it's so hard to take care of these patients if you don't take care of thyroid eye disease patients. But most of us encounter them somewhere in our practice. This woman was diagnosed with Graves disease in 1992. She had lid retraction and proptosis at the time. And then in 2011, she came to us with binocular dipopia and eye pain. Over that time frame, she'd had anxiety, depression. They caught a vitamin D deficiency, which we now know is related. We didn't know back then. She wasn't a smoker. Her thyroid levels had been stable. Her vision was good, but she had motility restriction. And this is how she looked. 2012 was not her year. She came back six months after that presentation in 2011, more light sensitivity. She didn't have optic neuropathy, but she was started on the Kahali protocol with IV uh, solumedrol or methylprednisolone. And that's six weeks of 500 milligrams followed by six weeks of 250 milligrams uh, once a week. Uh, her liver enzymes went up. Then once, but she did continue on the steroids. And then after completing the steroids, she had rebound inflammation and de developed compressive optic neuropathy. She underwent orbital decompression um, on each side sequentially, and then her pain improved, but she developed binocular diplopia. She had strabismus evaluation, didn't tolerate Fresnel prisms, and ended up having uh, strabismus surgery. Then over the, from 2013 to 2019, she had multiple eyelid surgery. She developed cataracts from all her steroids, um, and she, but she was relatively stable. And this is that period in taking care of type of timing, taking care of these patients where you think, Gosh, she's, she's not totally happy, but we're getting her there with the idea that we're putting her back to her pre-disease state really isn't true, right? We're trying to improve at her, but she's really not back to her pre-disease state. But she was getting along okay. And then in 2020, she came to me and said, oh, I have new onset double vision. I have pain. All those emotions, anxiety, depression is coming back. So this is the list of what we had in our toolkit in 2019 and in you know, early January of 2020. And you can see all the different things we've taught we can uh, treat her with. The reason there's so many treatments is because none of them are good, right? None of them really uh, cover all the bases and take care of everything. If you look at the uh, UGOGO and the European groups, what they've recommended is you can see they're really heavy with steroids. You can see each of these pathways kind of lead to steroids, but there's issues with steroids. Oral steroids are really only 60% beneficial short-term to reducing those inflammatory signs. And there's no proof that it helps strabismus. IV corticosteroids are about 70% effective in reducing inflammation, but there's lots of other, excuse me, lots of other issues with them. And steroids are not useful for strabismus or eyelid retraction typically. And they really just have a mild effect for proptosis. Some people will advocate for radiotherapy, and you're going to have a great panel later on today on thyroid eye disease. Um, so you'll hear some of the, the proponents of each of these. Um, and radiotherapy decreases inflammation, 
but it doesn't um, really have any benefit on proptosis or lid retraction. It may help compressive optic neuropathy. And again, we can't use it for younger patients. It can cause cataracts and uh, radiation retinopathy. Now in the US in January of 2020, uh, tepratumumab was approved. And this is a human monoclonal antibody against the insulin growth factor one receptor. Uh, it, it's being used for active, moderate and severe thyroid eye disease. And really it's targeting that insulin growth factor one receptor, which sits on the orbital fibroblast uh, there. Uh, the studies were done in patients that were newly diagnosed with thyroid eye disease within the last nine months or so. So I just kind of tried, we had the, I had the privilege of being the primary investigator on one of the phase two, on the phase two trial for tepratumumab here at the University of Iowa. And then there's also a phase three trial. So as you can see, there are eight infusions. Every three weeks, the patient gets an infusion. Really about 80 patients total got tepratumumab and finished the course of it. Um, and what you can see is looking at the 24 weeks that there was a significant difference in the improvement of proptosis of greater than two millimeters. Over 70% of people, patients had an improvement compared to 20% and 9.5% of the placebo patients. And then the proptosis reduction was about three millimeters um, uh, in the tepratumumab patients compared to the placebo patients. Just because of time, there was a slight change in the proptosis of, of the placebo group as well. Now, if you look at some other measures in the phase three trial, double vision did improve, but it didn't resolve uh, completely in a lot of the patients, but they did have an improvement of one grade, whether it was in primary, end gaze or intermittent double vision, the quality of life score improved and the CAS site clinical activity score also decreased at the 24 week period. So those were really promising results and we were really excited uh, to get it approved in the US. Um, there are some adverse events. In fact, inflammatory bowel disease is a significant one. And so uh, those patients were actually excluded from the phase three trial. Uh, patients have had di diarrhea, muscle spasms, mild nausea and some hearing impairment, which all resolved uh, subjectively by the end of the study. This is from that New England Journal paper. You can see the placebo patient really didn't have much change. If not, it had worsening of the lid retraction injection and proptosis. And then the tepratumumab patient had improvement. Um, and you can see the scans there below. Uh, but this is from the New England Journal paper. So this is probably the best patient in the study. Uh, so I thought today I'd just show you some of my patients. Uh, I've had the pleasure of um, being able to treat patients now with tepratumumab. We started uh, about midway through the year. And, and so I've had a, a number of patients that have completed all uh, 24 weeks. And so I wanted to sh share a couple of them and their stories with you, because I think this is, at this point in this drug, this is kind of where we are. Um, if you're looking for data that doesn't come from the, uh, um, the companies, right? It doesn't come from uh, the actual pharmaceutical company, because uh, uh, you'll hear more later today about some other trials from them. So this was a 42 year old patient who had thyroid eye disease. He'd been on the, uh, for about two years, he'd been on the Kahali protocol. So he'd had IV solumedrol. He'd had 12 weeks of that. He had oral steroids after that because he had some rebound inflammation and he even had a thyroidectomy. Um, and then with the uh, tepratumab, you can see after the eight infusions, he had approximately three millimeters of reduction in proptosis in both eyes. He still has lower lid retraction. He still has temporal flare. He still has a little upper lid retraction, but he has a noticeable decrease in um, his cast score, his comfort. Um, in fact, he had significant uh, muscle spasms that really affected his quality of life, but he decided not to stop the drug because he was so excited about how his eyes were feeling um, and looking. So that's one example. This is another patient uh, uh, who is a 58 year old who had thyroid eye disease with, and he underwent an oral decompression for compressive optic neuropathy. I met him and operated on him the next week for a compressive optic neuropathy. And then he had some oral prednisone um, just coming off of the decompression. Um, but then after the decompression, he still had diplopia um, and some and discomfort. And so we started him on tepratumumab. Again, we are not really sure who the right patients are for this drug at this point in time. So we started this gentleman on it and you can see he's had a three, two and a half to three millimeter reduction in proptosis. The interesting thing about him is that his wife does not like his appearance. She feels like he's his eyes look too sunken in and enophthalmic. Uh, and so that was one cautionary tale. Now that we, if we're going to have the potential to use tepratumumab, uh, we've got to be careful potentially about doing oral decompressions and the sequence of those. And this patient tolerated tepratumumab very well. He had no, uh, no symptoms or side effects that he could uh, tell whatsoever. This is a woman who talking about a long history. She's a 30 year old. She had 13 years of thyroid eye disease and uh, had 
uh, orbital decompression and then was doing well, but had a reactivation. She underwent the Kahali protocol again. So 12 weeks of IV solumedrol. And then I actually put her on tocilizumab and she didn't budge. You can see this is what she looked like after, this is after her decompression and all those treatments. I then, uh, she's halfway through her uh, cycle now with tepertumumab. And you can see she's had one and two millimeter reduction in apoptosis, but interestingly, her lid retraction has improved significantly. And that's not something we're always seeing. So why did her lid retraction improve, but other patients, their lid retraction is not improving as much? It's, kind of, it's very interesting. Uh, she also has been tolerating it very well. And then I thought we'd go back to this patient. So this is the patient that had had 28 years of thyroid eye disease. Uh, you can see this is, she's having this nuance at double vision, pain, pressure, uh, motility issues as well. Uh, and I said, let's just see how much of this is uh, inflammatory. So I put her on three days of 60 of prednisone. And she said, I feel like a new woman. I feel fantastic. All that anxiety and depression was going away. And she was excited again. But I said, you know, think about, do you want to go back on steroids? You've been on both IV and oral in the past. Um, and didn't tolerate those uh, wonderfully? Um, or do you want to maybe consider this new drug? We don't know if it will work in you after having thyroid eye disease for 28 years. Well, she got on Facebook. There's a Facebook group for thyroid eye disease patients. She got on Facebook and all her friends on Facebook told her to do it. So uh, we put her on tepratumumab uh, and she is thrilled. Uh, her her proptosis uh, improved three millimeters on the road right and four millimeters on the left. Her echo at the end of the eight doses showed that uh, one millimeter reduction in each of the extra aquiline muscles uh, for six of the eight of them and her motility has improved. She still has lid retraction. Mind you, she's had lots of lid surgery. So her still uh, surgery, uh, lid still look like she's had multiple surgeries but she's doing much better. Interestingly, she thanked me for getting rid of her tinnitus. Uh, and uh, we've been doing audiology testing on some of these patients because we don't have objective data. And we did find that she had some hearing reduction, which is uh, in, uh, which improved her tinnitus as well. Um, and we're waiting to see if as uh, three months after the, her, her protocol, we are gonna start her uh, back with an audiology test and see if that hearing improved as subjectively the patients did in the study. So the temper two is now approved in the US. Um, for thyroid eye disease, it's our only approved drug. There's other drugs in the pipeline. In fact, the University of Iowa is participating in a study looking at could, uh, increased catabolism by IgG in a subcutaneous in, uh, medication rather than this IV infusions we're getting with the tepertumumab. But there's a lot we don't know, right? We don't know who's going to respond, how long of a window you have. Maybe Rundle's curve is, is shot. I mean, we don't really, Rundle's curve needs to be revisited. Um, we need some investigator initiated trials. We need to look at these patients uh, critically and uh, the side effects critically. And we need some head to head trials. We need also international access because we know that, um, that thyroid eye disease is a different beast in different countries and around the world. So we look forward to hopefully branching out. The Horizon Therapeutics has said that they're looking now at um, expanding beyond the US with the drug. So hopefully that will happen in the near future. Thank you again for the opportunity uh, to uh, be here today. This is what it looks like in Iowa right now. Um, and uh, this is my email and this is both my Twitter and Instagram handle. So I look forward to, uh, happy to have any of you reach out. Thank you again for the opportunity. I'm gonna turn it back to Lisa who will interview uh, Dr. Uh, in, introduce Dr. Pappas. Great. While Dr. Pappas gets her slides up, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Dr. Pappas has been in private practice in Melbourne, Florida since 2000. She's the founder and president of Pinnacle Eye Center in Melbourne. She received her medical education at the University of Cincinnati. She served as a resident at Howard University Hospital in Washington, D.C. and completed a fellowship in glaucoma at the University of Maryland. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and she currently serves on the program committee for the American Glaucoma Society. She is the current president of Women in Ophthalmology uh, for this year, which we're very grateful for. And she's also served on the board for several years in capacity of uh, development director and AAO counselor. So she's provided a lot of years of service for WIO. She's the president of the Howard uh, University Hospital Alumni Association and also is a member of NMA, AMA, FSO, and belongs to the Brevard County chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. 
Her son, Alex, recently joined her practice as an associate, and she is a proud grandmother of a vivacious grandson, Lucas. Her daughter-in-law, Jessica, is expecting and is due with another addition to the family, a granddaughter in April. And uh, I think Dr. Pappas is going to prep both of them for careers in ophthalmology. Um, we are uh, very grateful. Uh, she is uh, our president this year, and we're very grateful for her leadership and uh, look forward to her talk on glaucoma. You just need to unmute Regine. And Aaron, did you stop sharing your screen? Okay. So while Dr. Pappas, are you, um, I'll give you a minute here to get your slides up. Erin, I was gonna ask you a question. Um, so you had mentioned the order um, maybe needs to change when you're thinking about Tepratumabat, I only know it by the brand name, uh, and uh, decompression surgery. Um, what would you suggest, what order do you think, uh, what would you do now for patients that need it? Sure, uh, thank you, Dr. Nichab. Uh, it really is gonna depend on the patient's condition, right? And if they have compressive optic neuropathy, something needs to be done and something needs to be done quickly. So uh, some people will treat those patients with IV um, uh, methylprednisolone or IV steroids. Often I'll start with the IV steroids and try to get them to the operating room as soon as I can, traditionally for uh, orbital decompression. Now, depending on how quickly you can get, as you guys, as you can imagine, uh, tepertumab is not cheap. Uh, and so there's a process to go through um, to get it from the insurance companies. And insurance companies are figuring out um, how much they want to cover and who they want to cover. But we, we, here at the University of Iowa, we're kind of getting, we have a team together and, we're, and our, we're getting to work with our insurance company. So we're having a little more success with that. And uh, so we can get it more quickly. So if you can get it quickly, some people are starting actually to use tepertumumab for these compressive optic neuropathy patients. I haven't done that yet. I've always done the, the decompression first, but this one gentleman might be a game changer for me and I might see how quickly I can get it. And if I can hold those patients at bay with some IV steroids while I'm trying to get the drug. So, so, it, so ideally, if you can, then you would prefer to do that first and then the decompression surgery. Well, I can like always that. do the decompression exactly on the end, okay. but but the uh, the drug and how much it's going to take effect and how much it's going to benefit them is the thing we don't always know. Most people, it looks like, are getting about three, two and a half to four millimeters. Um, and the question is, would you get more or less if you've already had a decompression and you have that scarring in that area? That's another thing we don't know. Oh, mm -hmm. That's a very so, good. So point. there's a yeah. lot of factors and a lot of things to think about. Uh, so it should be interesting. But Dr. Schreier, those were like really impressive cases. Like, I, like out of everything I've seen, like for tired eye disease, I mean, just like seeing those, like even after a few doses, such a like drastic change in the appearance. And uh, I, I mean, it's kind of, it's very exciting. I definitely would call it a game changer from retina perspective. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you know, like, like I said, I, I love thyroid eye disease, but I started for like, maybe eight years of my career, there was a, oh, uh, my, a third of my clinic is thyroid eye disease patients and I don't have a lot to offer them. But now I'm like, thyroid eye disease, all right, let's see if we can get it for them. Uh, so so that, that has really been exciting for me and it's changed my outlook. It's changed like going to work and seeing these patients. It, it's really fun. And the patient's outlook has is, is improved as well. You know, so knowing that sure. is something that, knowing that there's something out there potentially for them is something that I think is really uh, exciting in that sense. Do we want to go ahead? Maybe we'll switch the order here. Um, Dr. Schreiber, if you want to do the next introduction, we'll give Dr. Pappas a few. Do you all see it or you don't? Oh, we don't see it. Are you able to share your screen? Um, okay. For whatever reason, the share screen function, I got to see if I can get to it. Just a second. Go ahead. Take it. And, 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 um, um, I think I need to access the share screen function here. All right. Well, we can switch to Dr. Um, Bezovich, maybe. Is that okay? Okay. Well, I think I've got it now, hopefully. Um, I just needed to press share. Oh, there you go. Yeah, awesome. yeah you got yes. it. I apologize. Great. No problem. Um, so That's great. Okay. <laughs> 
So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the current medical and surgical innovations in glaucoma management. And we've already heard from Dr. Nija um, the fallout from uh, uh, glaucoma management, but I have some pearls that, that might help. <laughs> um, the prevalence of glaucoma uh, is the third leading cause of global blindness and uh, after uncorrected refractive error in cataracts, and it's a progressive uh, silent uh, retinal ganglion cell disease. Uh, the traditional um, medical uh, therapy for, for lowering pressure uh, has been unchanged for quite a number of years. And um, for the most part, it, it gives about 20 to 40% um, a reduction in pressure and the, it's doing so by many mechanisms. So Dr. Nijam um, did go ahead and give us an overview of this. However, of note, the, the uh, group that was added uh, back in 07, the prostaglandin analogs uh, that decreased uveal scleral outflow had the largest uh, pressure reduction aside from the um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Uh, the rest of the, the uh, medications that we've had for a very, very long time were mostly in the category of decreasing aqueous production, except for pil pilocarpine, which was the only direct uh, agonist that uh, increased outflow. And then in come the novel therapies. And um, these therapies uh, have really been a game changer um, for uh, refractory care uh, and, and glaucoma patients that might not be amenable to surgical treatment, um, might be a little too old or for whatever reason. Um, and that class of agent, those class of agents um, are a novel class of agents, first ones in 20 years to, to be introduced. Um, and we have uh, three of them uh, that are, currently in use uh, in the United States. And the one that's most effective, of course, is the fixed combination row kinase inhibitor, uh, the tarsidil and latanoclerus uh, together. And, and as you can see, all four categories in terms of the mechanism of action are active in this um, particular um, uh, drug, the fixed combination. The only um, sad part, of course, as Dr. Nijam mentioned, is that it wreaks havoc, the havoc on the ocular surface. The ocular hyperemia is uh, significant in almost 60% of patients. And it also is associated with cornea vesiculata and conjunctival hyperemia. Um, this novel drug, this long acting implant uh, is the next um, horizon, so to speak. And uh, it has a great safety record and IOP reduction of about 30 to 33%. So I'm gonna show you a video um, of the you implantation of Duracell. The implantation of Imatoprost implant 10 micrograms in the left eye of this lady who had an implantation done in her right eye two weeks before. After laying out the necessary supplies, the elite spectrum was put in their left eye after it had been prepared with betadine. The sterile applicator was removed from the box. And after inspection, the needle was used to pierce the sclerotemporal peripheral cornea and the actuator button was pressed using the drug into the anterior chamber. A sterile Q-tip was applied to the sclerotemporal needle track and soon after there was no view of the durista implant in the anterior chamber as it settled into the inferior angle. The least specimen was subsequently removed from the eye and a drop of antibiotic instilled in the eye. The patient remained in the upright a sitting position for 15 to 20 minutes and then was then released to go home. Darista has been a wonderful addition um, to my armamentarium uh, and I use it in patients um, that can't um, tolerate medication, particularly uh, those that either have allergies to medications and, and a number of, of different uh, reasons, memory loss, uh, et cetera, so it, it's a great addition. Um, hopefully with uh, the, um, the new studies that, that are going to indicate um, 
in terms of how long uh, this drug can last. Right now in the US, it's only allowed um, to be used once a year and we may be able to um, customize that in the future. Video shows the uh, novel strategies are um, on the horizon that are non IOP, uh, dip, uh, that are IOP independent, but we don't have time for that uh, at this uh, time. So we'll move on to surgical innovations. And um, we have MIGS, uh, minimally invasive glaucoma uh, surgeries, and um, LIGS, uh, less invasive glaucoma surgeries. And these, uh, modalities are new modalities that offer us an alternative to uh, traps and tubes. And uh, so this ab internal procedures for the most part have great safety uh, profiles, ha have uh, uh, the use of the, the gonioscope. So that takes uh, a little bit of getting used to um, and turning the patient's head, um, positioning the patient is something that um, needs to be worked on when you're trying to learn this modality. Um, the uh, targets are the conventional outflow and, and the uveal scleral outflow. The one drug that was uveal scleral outflow related uh, is no longer Cypass was um, recalled. Uh, the LIGs are subconjunctival route, the Zen, and of course, uh, P3 laser, which is the newest modality for uh, laser uh, treatment of ciliary body. So again, these are the um, different uh, mechanisms and types of, of uh, MIGs and LIGs that are available. The um, iStent Supra and the InFocus are not yet available. And ECP, um, the iStent Inject and the Hydrus have to be combined with um, uh, cataract surgery in the US. So these are uh, the, the diff images of the different types of, um, of devices that we have uh, in case you are not familiar. Um, and in terms of staging uh, with my patients, um, I really customize what their needs are. Uh, the MIGs I use in mild and, and moderate cases. I, I do not um, tend to use them in severe cases, but I do use LIGs in um, severe glaucoma. And I also use the P3 laser in combination with a lot of these um, as well. So here's some, uh, this is a video. Um, this patient already had had a previous cataract surgery as well as uh, a previous glaucoma surgery. And um, this is an omni surgical system. It viscodilates as well as um, does the, the uh, gonioscopy. So it's really whatever you need or want for the patient. Um, in this case, I will be unroofing um, the inferior portion um, in order to uh, uh, perform the goniotomy. What you want, if you want to do the full 180 degrees, um, do a, an a entire 360 degree um, Goniotomy, or if you want to viscodilate one half, and um, here you can see that I'm unroofing the canal as I'm retracting the catheter so that I'm performing goniotomy. So, in the interest of time, we'll move on. Um, the Zen Ab Interno um, was the original way of implanting this device. Um, I uh, I'm demonstrating a, a um, video from Dr. Um, Bedrood. And uh, you, you'll see that there are certain techniques that can be used to mark the, the conjunctiva uh, in order to be able to place um, the Zen in a proper position. The Vera hook is then used uh, to um, counter, to apply counter traction so that you can um, uh, deploy the, uh, um, Zen, and if you mark the tip, you can see it uh, in the subconjunctival space to make sure that you don't get caught up in Tenon's capsule. And um, that is uh, very important um, because of the primary reason for scar tissue formation in this particular procedure is uh, scarring at the level of Tenon's. 
and you, you want to test to make sure that, that you have a mobile um, Zen. So um, the legs can be used in refractory cases, as I said before. Uh, and in this particular um, patient, I had implanted um, a Zen that was successful on the right. On the left, I had uh, had trouble with the Zen such that um, it was bent. I went back and um, did an external, external Zen, Zen implant implantation. Video. You have to be really careful when you're implanting not to have it go too far because the uh, um, loader can sometimes overshoot. So uh, you want to have the delivery be subconjunctival and not get caught up in tenons. You test and close your conj with 9-0 Vicryl uh, in a running locking fashion. Externals and implant video. So this patient had two successful Zens placed and um, the P3 I use for uh, anyone that needs additional uh, lowering, especially if they've already had as this patient, um, other procedures like a micro express. So in summary, um, MIGs and LIGs can um, be used to customize and personalize the individual needs uh, that your patient need uh, to achieve your, your patient's target pressure. And it does not preclude um, traditional um, surgical options later on. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Dr. Pappas. While you're uh, stopping screen share and Dr. Uh, Vizovich is getting a uh, screen share, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce her. Uh, I, I, uh, Dr. Vizovich is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at Duke University Eye Center and Director on the Board of Women in Ophthalmology. She's a leader in vitroretinal surgery research and teaching. Um, her particular area of interest is cutting edge technologies and recovery of vision in hereditary retinal disease with retinal implants and stem cell technology. She's co-director of the Duke Pediatric Retina and Optic Nerve Center, and she directs the Duke Center for Artificial and Regenerative Vision, where she implants the Argus II bionic eye to restore vision to individuals with total blindness. So this topic today really fits, fits her area of interest. She's an influential educator, and she organizes and directs several highly successful national and international courses, including the first of its kind, Advances in Pediatric Retina course at Duke, and the International Duke fellows in vitreous surgery course. She's received numerous prestigious awards and honors, including the Retina Society Fellowship Research Award, the Society of Heeds Fellows Award, and the American Society of Retinal Specialists uh, Senior Honor Award. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Vizovich, who's gonna be speaking about what's new in neovascular AMD and DME pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaya, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak as well. Um, it is uh, my true honor. I'm going to be talking about a, uh, advances in uh, retinal surgery, uh, primarily in treatment of, um, of um, retinal disorders. These are my disclosures. We currently have um, four anti-VEGF agents on the market that we uh, frequently used for treatment of wet macular degeneration as well as DME. And we all are very familiar with um, these um, agents, but um, that treatment has been really much stalling for the last decade or so. So, so we're excited to see that there are many new drugs in the pipeline um, that uh, hopefully are gonna address the biggest problem in retinal care currently, which is the frequent um, need of injections and um, really unable to keep up with the bur burden of treatment for our patients as well as for physicians themselves. So the current drugs have very much increase, increasing the durability of the treatment and some of those are sustained release options. And you can list, there's a laundry list of the drugs coming down the pipeline and we are 
we are excited that some of these um, will be quite um, promising. And I'll be limiting my discussion to primarily the ones in our in phase two and above. And really, as we look at these um, drugs, we would um, group them into three categories, intravitreal injections with really longer duration. Some of these are intraocular sustained delivery implant and lastly, gene therapy. So we'll start with the intravitreal injections. The brolocystinum, which is recently improved drug for treatment of wet AMD, is a much smaller molecular as compares to um, other agents that are on the market. It is, for that reason, favorable because it does penetrate well tissue. However, there has been reports of intraocular inflammation as well as um, incidences of um, occlusive vasculitis in these patients. So those are some safety issues that are currently um, ongoing and being investigated further. And the, the further trials for DME are very much enrolled in phase three and are showing promising results just like what AMD treatment has been as well. The Codex Sciences has KSI 301, which is a interesting conjugate ABC platform, which allows for longer duration. It actually allows for Q3 to five month dosing versus currently what we have in terms of a aflibrosap, which is a Q8 week drug. Um, so exciting to have a longer duration options. And currently this drug is also in phase two trials uh, for wet AMD and DME. The next exciting option is this DPAL formulation of Sunilimab, which is a gray bug um, um, product. This type of drug, it will inhibit all anti-VEGF um, agents being VEGF A, B, C, and D, as well as the DLK inhibition. So it's essentially um, blocking all the um, VEGF receptors, which is for that reason promising. But really the imp interesting part is the fact that it, it comes as a depot form. And you'll notice in these uh, lower images, fundus images, um, that it, the drug itself is injected posteriorly, it expands, and it's kind of this uh, formula that really degrades very slowly over the next few months and lasts as long as six months in duration. There have been some reports of migration of this drug to anterior segment, uh, which um, since the company has slightly changed the formulation and is further investigating this in um, ongoing trials. Um, Genentech or Roche has uh, brought us recently Farisimab, which is for the first time uh, a biophasic um, antibody designed not only to uh, attack anti-VEGF receptors, but also ANG2 or anti-ANG2. And for that reason, it's promising to enhance not only, not only uh, block the leakage, but potentially cause a vessel stabilization and healing. And these, um, th this drug is currently in phase D trials for wet MD and DME, and recently was reported in my, at the Macula Society as well, the, um, the Bascom Palmer Angie and Genesis course that um, really promising phase three results for this drug and lasting as long as 16 week in generation and simple intravitreal injection. So clearly, clearly there's quite a few intravitreal injection forms coming down the pipeline that are very much promising to increase the duration of the drug in the eye and help us with treatment of wet microagitation and DME. Now we're gonna be moving on to sustained delivery implants. Being that I'm, I'm a surgeon, I'm always very excited about surgical options. And this is an implant, a, a reservoir that can um, be implanted beneath the conjunctiva and left there. And then it can be refilled every six months or so with a uh, refillable needle in clinic in, in office procedure. And in current phase three pivotal trials, archway and portal, they're showing that exactly that, that you know, duration of this drug or slow elution of this drug lasts for about six months or so. And some patients can actually go as long as a year without any refills. And further investigations are ongoing with phase three trials for DME, which are Pagoda and Pavilion. And you'll notice it's actually quite a simple design where there's very slow, um, a dilution of the very high concentrated drug into the, in the implant, making its way into the eye and slowly by passive diffusion, really um, uh, passively, uh, passing into uh, vitreous cavity. And the uh, implantation is quite simple and reminds us often of glaucoma procedures where we're you know, taking meticulous attention to the sclera and kind of cauterization, accessing uh, 
supracortical space and then cord itself. And really um, you'll shortly see that this implant is um, just injected um, and then meticulously covered with tenons and conch to ensure, ensure there's, there's no erosion or potentially um, uh, infection down the road. And here are some uh, uh, images of the patients with this implant. Um, and as I mentioned, the cl uh, clinical trials phase three are ongoing by showing quite promising results um, currently. Now we're going to be moving on to gene therapy as a uh, delivery approaches of anti-VEGF blockade. And there are a couple of companies that are looking to uh, treatment with um, gene therapy for retina AMD and DME. First being Adverum, which involves an intravitreal injection of a V vector. Um, this vector particularly would be producing a Furbicep coding sequence. It has already been fast-tracked by the FDA and uh, currently their phase two um, AMD and DME trials ongoing. While it's exciting to have intravitreal injection as an option, um, there has been uh, reports of inflammation associated with this approach um, and kind of further investigations uh, into this um, have been ongoing, but again, quite promising. And last um, is uh, a gene therapy delivery is a surgical um, option. This is by Regenix Bio, RGX314, our clinical trials kind of looking into these options. And um, they are looking particularly in delivering a, um, a gene therapy product in subretinal location, intravitreal approach, where we, we are using subretinal needle to develop, deliver it there. This approach delivers the drug exactly what it's needed in subretinal location. It kind of bypasses these um, you know, inflammatory um, responses from the eye itself. So the studies have shown that not only promising results in, in terms of not needing recurrent injections in clinic, but also minimal um, rates of um, inflammation as well. Um, so exciting approaches coming down the pipeline and this company is particularly looking at, at further studies, uh, phase um, two and three for the subretinal approach, um, looking at DME as well and DR as an option, but also now um, investigating whether this uh, gene therapy drug can really inject in supracortical space and, um, and can aid in blockade that way as well. So to summarize to you, we have quite a few exciting pipeline drugs uh, for neovascular AMD and DME coming, um, coming to potentially market in the next year or two. Some of these are promising phase three results. Overall, I think we're excited that they're not only targeting uh, VEGF, but also other, um, other markers and um, gene therapy, I think is gonna be an exciting way of changing the management of these patients. Um, so readouts are coming and future seems quite bright. Um, and thank you again uh, for listening in and thank you for this opportunity to present and share data with you. And these are my contacts uh, on their email or on LinkedIn. I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Nujim to speak just a little bit more about women in ophthalmology. Thanks, Dr. Vizovich. That was such an interesting presentation and an excellent uh, overview of all the innovations from all the presenters crossing the globe. Uh, that was uh, a lot of great information. Um, I'm going to use your slide, so if you don't mind, if you can advance to the next one, please. I just wanted to give in the few minutes that we have left um, a uh, brief overview of women in ophthalmology uh, so that you're familiar with our organization. So we were founded to enhance and improve the professional environment for women ophthalmologists. WIO encourages diversity, impartiality, and economic parity and strives to cultivate new opportunities for leadership, education, and public service in the field of ophthalmology. Can move to the next slide. And so we actually have had a lot of international work. And so we're so, that's one of the reasons why we're so excited to be here at AIOS. And I really want to thank Dr. Namrata Sharma for inviting us. Uh, we've had the last um, several years at WOC, we've had panels uh, and receptions. Dr. Shriver led an excellent panel um, for the past two years, uh, two sessions for WOC. Our summer symposium had attendees from 15 different countries. Uh, we have a seat on the Academy Advisory Council, and we work with outreach to ophthalmologists and allied organizations uh, globally. We also partner with charitable organizations uh, such as Orbis International. And so we're always looking for ways to collaborate and work with other organizations internationally uh, to help improve the environment for women ophthalmologists. Next slide, please. 
but that's not all we do. Uh, we have a career coaching program. We've launched a speakers bureau this year. We have CME webinars regularly. We've got a clinical trials training program uh, that Dr. Shriver mentioned earlier, which is brand new. Uh, and we're using that to help involve more women ophthalmologists in research. And we have member chapters uh, internationally and sister organizations internationally. So we really encourage you to be a part uh, and to join us. And next slide, please. Uh, and uh, if uh, we're, you're all invited, everyone, men and women, are invited uh, to our summer symposium. Uh, this year, we have the privilege of having it in Amelia Island, Florida, from August 26th to the 29th. There will also be live streams, so there'll be a virtual option available uh, if um, traveling is not in the cards this year. Uh, and we really would love to have you. So uh, uh, we really appreciate this opportunity and and thank AIOS um, for inviting us and for partnering together with Women Ophthalmology. And thank you all for being here. Uh, if we have a few minutes, we can do some questions. Is that correct? Are we, I actually, I think I'm looking at the time. I think we are, we are right on time to finish. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to all the panelists uh, and thank you to AIOS. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon in, 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 the, in some parts of the world. Good morning in other parts of the world. Uh, we now have the symposium, a joint symposium between the All India Ophthalmic Society and the Asia Pacific Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Uh, we have an extremely interesting program with uh, outstanding speakers. And uh, the I'm Frank Martin, I'm chairman. My co chairman is uh, Sebastian Dea. The convener for this symposium is Yogesh Shukla. Co convener, Kalpana Narendran. And our moderator is Shashi. Frank, your audio is not clear, please. We can't hear you. Pardon? You can't hear me? You can't hear me? Uh, no, Frank, we can't hear you. A little soft. Okay, I'll try another one. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Right. And good it's evening, good. Frank. Good evening. And, and, good, and good morning to those in India.